Uh, good evening, councillors, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's uh, meeting of corporate scrutiny. Um, uh, first item on our agenda is apologies for absence. I believe we have apologies from Councillor Chris Bain and Councillor Marie Bailey. Do we have any further apologies? Okay. Uh, just quickly to remind everybody, this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Thank you. Item two on our agenda is minutes of the previous meeting, which I believe was held on the 18th of March. Is it the committee's wish they are a correct record? Do I have a mover, please? Councillor Price has moved. Councillor Smith has second. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. Item three on our agenda is any declarations of interest. Uh, the record show there are none. Item four is chair's update. Uh, this was a meeting put in at the last minute, so I don't have any updates for this meeting. Item five is responses to reports of the corporate screening committee. We have none for this meeting. Item six is consideration of matters referred to corporate scrutiny by from cabinet or council. Neither cabinet or council has referred any business to this committee at this time. Racing through this, uh, which takes us to item seven. Uh, obviously, this is the working group we set up. Um, this is a, a, an item on our agenda to take any feedback, and we've kindly got uh, Councillor Sam Smith and Tina Mustafa with us this evening to take any questions. Obviously, still working through housing repairs and other housing issues, as was the wish of the committee at the start of the year. Uh, we decided to concentrate this little piece on void turnaround. So, obviously, we've got like I say, the portfolio at the office are with us. Uh, a report has been circulated. I'd like to put on record thank you to Mr. Weston for being very concise in the report. A lot of detail answering the working group's initial questions. So um, I'm willing to open the floor to the report. I don't know, Sam, if you want to introduce anything. Yeah, thanks, Chair. No, I was just going to say that um, uh, Tina's filling in for, for Paul tonight, so thank you, Tina. Um, all I'd say is uh, it'd be interesting to hear your comments tonight on, on, on this particular issue. It is a pertinent issue, I suppose, that has been in, in my mind over the course of the last year. Clearly, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of improvements to be done. And it's vital now that obviously we, we put more of a strategy and a plan together to uh, seek that improvement. Thank you. Anything to add at this time, Tina? Okay. I'd also like to welcome to the committee, committee Councillor Dean and Councillor Clark, who obviously um, ISAG members who were obviously on the um, working group uh, as we invited them across. Happy for you to stay and contribute to the entire meeting? May as well. <laughs> okay, uh, so obviously we're discussing uh, voids this evening. There is quite a lot of information that has been circulated. Uh, there has been some concern raised by the committee, certainly around turnaround and some other matters in regards quality. So I'm happy to open the floor there and take any questions or comments. Councillor Dean. Thank you. Um, as, as you know, we've had a couple of meetings now of the working group and we look, looked at specifically at the voids and I was able to give a bit of input because I've had voids either side of me at home and was concerned about the amount of time they've taken and then was given a report back on how much these had cost to redo. So in looking at the report that's come through, there, there is a bit of concern about how these costs are mounting up and why we need to do what we need to do. I mean, obviously, they need to be fit for purpose when people go into them. But there's an issue then about the amount of time. There's an issue about the money that we're losing. And there's that, that need to understand how this can be rectified, really. Because while we've got the statistics there, we haven't got what the solution is. And that's what we're looking for. Tina, Sam, any opening comment to that? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Dean. Happy to take those questions. So, just in terms of the first one around rent loss, um, as um, Paul Weston's report points out, that that is calculated based on the assumed level of rent loss for what should be 
the turnaround times by the contractor. So we already build into the budgets um, a one and a half percent rent loss as a result of that. So we're talking about the, the rent loss accrued over and above that, which you know is, is sizable and you know depending on an average of sort of two hundred and fifty voids over the year. If we assumed hundred pound a week, that'd be around three hundred thousand. But I think the point to say there in relation to that is we do enforce liquidated damages against the contractor. So there's a reconciliation at the year end of for every day that they were late in turning that property back, that is recharged back to the contractor in terms of that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of mitigating that cost. Um, but what I want to say in terms of the solutions around how we can improve on you know, the whole area around void turnaround time is the discussions I've had with Paul and the teams is that it will be sort of a multifaceted project. So yes, as the report quite rightly sets out, a key element of that will be working with the contractors through their service improvement plan to look at the ways in which we can um, you know, work with them to tackle that. But we see that there's a range of work streams on that. So you know, right from the beginning when we're notified of the empty property, so that pre sort of stage, you know, there'd be a tenancy management work stream around how we incentivise people to leave the properties in a better condition, what the exit inspections look like, how we prevent people moving if they've damaged the property. Um, the chair will recall that as the leader, we introduced an incentive to move scheme that people were given some recompense if they left the property in a good state. We could, we, it's already on the work plan to review all of that. So that would be a key work stream. As I've said, the other one is around equines and improving that. Then at the other end, so in terms of the sign up and then that post tenancy work, it's looking at the whole options around annual property MOTs. Um, and it was always an ambition that we'd work with the contractors to deliver that. And that's not been, um, we've not been able to achieve that yet. But this year, um, we're doing a 100% stock condition survey and we've taken the opportunity to go into every property or will be going into every property. And we're not only going to look at the attributes for the stock condition survey, but also those other issues around property condition, safeguarding, etc. And that will provide us with a good baseline around how we keep that up going forward. Um, but I think you'll agree from the level of detail in the report, those sorts of management type issues are peripheral. It is about working with Equans and working with the repairs contractor to really drive turnaround times. Because sort of we've done it before, five years ago, you know, the turnaround time was between 11 and 16 days. It was top quartile when we were benchmarked, you know, and other authorities were looking at the ways that we've, we've achieved that. We're now an average of 60 to 70 days. So it's breaking that down and understanding how we can get back to that. And it will, as the portfolio holder said, it'll take time and we're committed to, you know, working cross party to support that. So I think from our point of view is we'll come back with a detailed project plan and you know we'll be working collaboratively to to drive improvements and, and setting with yourselves targets to do that thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah I, I think from my experience of sitting there some of the time and watching the people come and go there were so many weeks when nobody turned up so there, is, there does seem to be a piece of work to do with the contractors about have they got the capacity to actually do these jobs and that's that's what it seems to be with a lot of this contract work is whether the capacity is there whether they budgeted it at the right um level so that they can actually do the work but that's that is our problem but it's not our problem in that we want things done so we need to make sure that they are, they have got that capacity and they're doing that work for us thanks Tina. Yeah, I mean, dare, dare I say it? Yeah, I think I dare. Obviously, we talked five years ago when we were top quartile. There's a fundamental difference between five years ago and now. That's the contractor. Is this a question we really need to be asking? I mean, I think we can be honest about, you know, we need to be challenging the contractor about, you know, if performance has slipped from where it was five years ago, we need to be fundamentally asking that question. But I bet I'm not giving you news there, am I? <laughs> uh, yeah, just to follow up as well, I mean, 
as Mrs Mustafa has rightly said, I was leader of this council when a report came to Cabinet um, offering tenants £50 reward if they retain, return their keys on time, if they were surrendering their council house. I had that voted down that evening. My principals were appalled that we had to pay people to return keys on time. And then Mrs Mustafa approached me a month later with a document that says that's how much rent you're losing. I quickly had it voted through at the next meeting. Advice to anybody on this council who's new, part your principals sometimes and listen to what the officer's got to say, because I was so wrong that day. Any further questions or comments? Councillor Price. Thank you, Chair. Um, can we just talk about high cost voids for a minute? Um, so high cost voids um, in 23-24, uh, there was a total of 70, which was roughly about a quarter of all voids. Um, cost being over, I don't know if I'm reading these numbers right, but 5,215 per void. Is that right, yeah? You're nodding, so I'm going to go, yeah. Um, so... Um, and, and it says in the report that the um, identified rechargeable repairs is currently sitting at 150,000, and we're expecting to recover less than 50% of that. Um, and then the, the line that, that's quite concerning to me is that um, many tenants never make any payment. So how how does a tenant how is a tenant able to damage the council's property and then not make a payment on it without any repercussions is my first question. Um, my second question is how as a as an authority, um, as a let's say um, a letting business if you will, we, we let properties to tenants, how do we let them properties get in that state in the first place? Do we not do yearly checks like I, I rent privately rent um, and and I have a six monthly check to make sure that my property is at the standard that it was at when I moved in do we not do something similar to prevent these unauthorized uh, changes to the property the damage the vandalism etc etc um, because that that that's a big chunk of the money that we're losing really and I understand that the turnaround time is is higher because there's there's more work involved but Surely we, we need to be looking at preventative um, measures to not let it get to that in, in the first place. Uh, and I find that quite concerning that we've, we've got uh, 70 properties that we're expecting to recover f less than 50% of the, of, of the cost to the authority. Um, that's, that's, that's a massive chunk of money that essentially is just walking out of this authority um, because uh, residents of Tamworth have decided to damage our property. Uh, in in any other line of business, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to go and vandalise somebody's property and, and not expect to to pay for it. That's... Thank you, Councillor Price. So, a couple of questions there. If we deal with the recharge first, the council does have an active and a robust recharge policy. Believe it or not. Um, and we do, as a result of people making an application to move, do a check in terms of the exit inspection as they're moving out in, in terms of determining their onward arrangements. Now, if the property has been assessed as being damaged and there's evidence of that, you know, it's not just occurred, you know, sort of at the time, sometimes they say when they're moved in, you know, there's some real extremes put in this report around twenty five to £50,000, which could be argued not been done in that period um, but if it is attributable to them then a couple of things happen we do prevent them moving you know if that housing need doesn't override the need for that so we do prevent them moving and ask them to rectify that and put um, recharge arrangements in place that we will do that and recharge them if their housing need is such that we cannot prevent that move and increasingly that's the case because you know people are moving for all sorts of social and medical reasons, then we do um, demote their housing application, so they're penalised under our allocations policy in terms of that. But if they are allowed to move on, then we do try and refer them to all the agencies to agree a payment plan. Um, and equally, that debt is actively pursued, and um, you know it's just the case that from affordability checks, because people see the recharge as not a primary debt like it would be paying your rent or more or um, council tax etc then that's why the levels are so low but there are active arrangements in terms of that 
But your second question is the key, really. We believe the solution lies in prevention, lies in doing those annual property inspections like it is in the in the private sector. And as I said to Councillor Dean a few moments ago, there has always been an ambition to do an annual property MOT. But because we assess that, you know, to do 4,000 a year would take three or four staff, it was always agreed the contractors would pick that up on our behalf because that's more efficient because they're going in to do three and a half thousand gas inspections for example and that's an opportunity to do that but we've not been able to progress that so that's why doing the stock condition survey this year in full so it's not cloned or based on sampling it is going to be a hundred percent stock condition that will allow us to get a baseline which then determines what the onward arrangement is and i think we will see a return to those property MOTs on a risk basis, you know. So some properties we might do annually, some might be two, three yearly, depending on those sort of occupant factors and based on those sorts of um, profiling. But yeah, we agree that needs to be looked at and that needs to form part of the improvement plan. Can I just come back, Jan? So can I can I ask then? Uh, I mean, that's great to hear that you're looking at the twelve monthly MOTs and etc. But Based on how much we're losing by not doing them checks, um, and I, I mean, I don't know the figures that it would cost to employ an officer to do them checks. Okay, so sure, in, in your opinion, would it not be beneficial for us to employ a member of staff full time to carry out them checks for us rather than us relying on a third party and and whilst i understand the the reasoning behind it you know they're going in they're doing gas checks they're doing electric checks i understand that um but but surely it would be more beneficial for that to be in our control as that is our asset um that, that we are protecting um and i've lost my train of thought completely forgotten what I was going to say but yeah yeah jump in yeah I was, I was just going to say I, I think it makes sense that we actually look at um, you know potentially bringing that inspection inspection aspect back I suppose in-house to some extent I, I, I do wonder you know at the end of the day if the the contractor is clearly doing the inspection sort of ad hoc sort of while they're there doing other stuff it's obviously not the primary concern potentially I should imagine they're not following a checklist or anything else like that. Um, so yeah, I do, I do agree. It needs to be. Uh, we need to explore that. And in my view, obviously there's a, there's a calculus to be done there. But in my view, it seems to make sense that it could actually save money. Um, and actually, the savings that we think we're getting at the moment actually can be saved by the preventative nature of having our own people in those in those properties. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the the benefit would be if that person that was doing the checks worked for the authority, they're, they're, they're not um, time constrained um, by having other jobs to go to which are put on them by the company. Uh, I don't know what their KPIs are, I don't know what the employees' targets are for how many properties they've got to inspect a day, et cetera, et cetera. But also, they've got no personal investment in it. And if anything, without sounding um, uh, like there's anything untoward going on, there is a benefit to them to not report or not check correctly a property because they are getting work from it at the end of it. And that seems like a little bit of a conflict of interest to me that we're asking the people that do the repairs to check uh, and make sure that no damage has been caused to a property, etc. Um, so I think that that's quite a, a, a big red flag that that we've put the trust in in the company and i'm not saying that, that they're doing anything wrong but we're putting trust in a company that we're paying to repair properties um we're putting the trust in them to to actually come to us and go well actually this property has been damaged you need you, you need to step in now that there, there are people out there that that would actually look at that and go this is a gold pot for me they're asking me to to check up on on work that i'm potentially going to be doing in the future why why would i go to them and tell them do, 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 do you know what i'm saying so I think that's quite a big red flag that we we need to bear in mind going forward, um, and I definitely think that's that, that something, if not a recommendation from this committee, but but something that you you, you definitely need to pick it up on um, that that we bring that back in house. Sorry, just before I fetch in the option of the portfolio, just to add on to that, would price per property be an issue here? If we're now paying them price per property, the more I work they identify, the more it costs them. 
Is that an issue, potentially? I've got Councillor Dean in the doorway, and I'll just take an answer on this, and I'll fetch you both in. Thank you. Um, just carrying on from what Councillor Price was saying, when you're in a rented property, you know you're going to have those checks. It centres your thoughts about what you should and shouldn't be doing. If we got to the stage where our tenants knew they were going to have a yearly check, you know, some of the things that are happening maybe wouldn't. And, you know, <laughs> this really pains me to say it, but sometimes the private sector do have the sticks, don't they? And it is about how we make sure that we don't end up with our properties being wrecked. Thank you. Um, I mean, yeah, absolutely agree with Councillor Price and Councillor Dean around looking at the options around annual property inspections, because clearly that will give us a level of baseline intelligence that determines the best way to manage that going forward, whether that's through the contractor or through us. We need to do that option appraisal. Um, and as I say, the stock condition survey this year, and the intention is the majority of that data will be ready by September, we will have a really good up-to-date picture of what the main issues are in order to be able to frame that option appraisal going forward. But I think as well as that, what's also important in terms of the improvement plan is different delivery models around housing management. Um, because whilst that is absolutely vital in terms of identifying the, pro the problem as you find it, it might not necessarily change the outcome. That person or household may still not be able to meet a recharge, may still have to move because of complex and social needs, and may still require a level of support. So in my humble experience, what I think is also important is looking at different ways of delivering what they call enhanced housing management. Again, I'll refer the chair to decisions he made around Errington when he was the leader. And, you know, I think he laughed at one point when we were going to have a resident support officer at Errington to try and manage, Still. tried to manage some of the issues around churn and challenges, etc. We took a report through to Cabinet last year um, and we showed that that, that um, project had been highly successful. You know, the numbers of empty properties had reduced by half, the level of spend had reduced by three quarters, void rates are down because people like to be there. And that's because there's an on-site um, sort of resident support officer who's working with those households to try and mitigate the causes. So, so I think property MRTs are crucial in terms of understanding their role, but I think looking at how we can manage that, because those schemes are also eligible for service charges, which if people are on benefit, attracts housing benefit. Um, so I think there's also those options as well. Thank you. Councillor Doyle. Thank you very much. Um, regular MOT is not a bad idea. Um, keeping an eye and making sure that the stock that we own is being reasonably maintained is a good one. But it's not as easy to enforce as you think. You quote the private sector. It doesn't always work in the private sector. There's plenty of re reality TV shows out there that shows what happens when private rentals go wrong. So we're not the only ones that are exposed to this. The interesting bit about this, well, for me, is I wonder how many of these people that have made a mess of properties in the council's uh, portfolio have actually moved from one council property to another. Unlike the private sector, we're bound by obligations, where no matter how much somebody messes up and how much damage they do to one of their properties, if they've got kids, if they're, uh, we have an obligation to rehouse them. It would have been interesting to see on the voids how many of them move on to further council properties and repeat what they've done there. It's a very difficult one to crack. Uh, the people who do this are not scared of the consequences. They wouldn't run up £5,000 worth of debt or even £500 worth of debt if they actually um, were in fear of the consequences. So it's what you call it. The major Fortunately, the majority of our tenants uh, are pretty good and we don't have issues with and this is a small part, but they are going to be extremely difficult to deal with. And I'll be honest, an MOT, yes, we need them as well, but 
It's not going to be the answer, and these people need to know that when they take on these properties, that they will be held accountable, and that's the difficult bit, because that's when the legislation kicks in to protect them. That's basically all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Any rebuttal? No, no I, I recognise what Councillor Doyle is saying. On, 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 in terms of the figures around those sort of repeat instances where people move into other council properties and then there's recurring issues I haven't got to hand, but we'll certainly look at that. But the point that I, I wanted to make is on the council's forward plan for later on um, in the new municipal year, we're going to be bringing proposals on a new tenancy management policy. Now, as you know, at the moment, we operate fixed term tenancies um, for the majority of our stock, lifetime tenancies for those one beds and sheltered. Now, that policy will look at whether that should continue or we should look at whether we use introductory or probationary tenancies and then a move back to more secure tenancies to create that balanced and social cohesion. Because you're absolutely right, it's about accountability and responsibility and some sanction if we then find that it's you know a breach of tenancy agreement or a breach of those conditions. So there will be an opportunity to strengthen that later on in the year when we've done that piece of consultation. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Councillor Dean, then I'll take Councillor May. Just for people's information, but and from my own experience, there are different reasons why people move out and we have to go in and we have to do lots and lots of work. One of my neighbours was a 90-year-old lady who passed away, so she didn't go on to any other accommodation. But she had lived there for 50 plus years and hardly anything had been done in the house. She hadn't had a new kitchen or a new bathroom because she didn't want the people in. So consequently, in, in times like that, there will be a cost because we've got to go in and modernise everything. So it isn't always that people have been in and abused the house. You know, Theresa had lived there quite happily and the place was lovely, but it just wasn't modern and how we would now let it. So we do have to no take account that, that there, is, there will be a chunk there of, of um, our rented places that will be in that section, I would imagine. She can't be the only one. Councillor Maycock. Chase Chair. Um, just looking at the, the SIP and when that's coming into force, has that gone to any of the other committees all if it's if it's been implemented next next month? I don't have that information to hand. I can find that out for you. I wouldn't like I mean I know the service improvement plan is being talked about, but I'm not sure which other scrutiny committees, if any, it's been to. I can find that out and come back to you, Councillor Maycock. Cheers. Um and on the um it says in one of the questions that obviously we asked about it how many contracts have been awarded it just says that equons is the main contractor so how many contracts do they hold so in terms of the repairing contractual arrangements there are two main contractors so equines provide the response repairs and voids and that kind of cyclical stuff and weights deliver the capital and the plan works um, they then themselves subcontract works in relation to different specialist trades but in terms of that I think those are the two main ones that are connected with this particular discussion. I don't just mean the actual contractors that, that does Equans hold multiple contracts with the council? I'd have to check that I don't think so but I'll have to check that uh, and in terms of the 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 lad where we're getting the the, the liquidation money back, it's twenty pound a day. Another part in the report um, might be in the action plan that you say that um, you've got a a step in clause, and that we can approach other contractors. Does that twenty pound a day include us approaching other contractors for the recoup? 
No, that's a good question, Councillor Mycott. No, the liquidated damages is based on the rent loss the council can reasonably recover. So the legal advice that we've had in the past is we can only seek to recover the amount that we would have lost. Now, based on our weekly rent, on average, £100 a week, that £20 reflects that, that amount we would be able to recover for every day that they go over those void time scales in the report. In terms of whether we choose to activate um, that clause in the contract around giving it to other contractors for fear of performance, then that's something entirely different. And that's based on um, you know, an ongoing dialogue with the existing contractor, because that's a last resort. So it's about, you know, have we worked with the contractors on performance improvement, on performance planning, you know, have we attempted to do all the things that we can before we do that? Um, but it is a sanction that's available to us. Uh, looking <coughs> at the action plan as well, um, it says uh, one of the outcomes is to improve the uh, KPI percentage. What it doesn't say is how long, because of, you, you, you're clearly not going to get up to the KPI in a couple of months. So is there any time scale on, on what you want to be seeing on that? Yeah, so... I mean, it's got to be realistic, hasn't it? And it's got to be smart in terms of that performance management. We know that we're in a regulatory environment now where we're potentially faced with the um, with, with an inspection from the regulator of social housing who will be looking at conventional key performance indicators. So I think knowing all that and knowing that the regulator is going to be looking for us to be you know, aspiring to that top medium quartile, then I think what we're going to be doing is we sit down, we're going to be working with the contractors and the portfolio holders across the various, and members across the various committees to agree what's reasonable. Um, you know, because going to top quartile, which is currently less than 24 days, when we're significantly below that, you know, we need to be able to have something that's realistic and done in collaboration with others. So there isn't a figure that I can say tonight, but we will come back with that as part of the improvement plan. Uh, I mean, it's good, it's good that you've highlighted, obviously the, the KPIs are horrendous, but what that's over a year period. How come that wasn't picked up in your... I think in terms of the ongoing turnaround time that there has been regular dialogue and discussions with the contractors working towards resolving that. Um, so, you know, I suppose it's, it's, it's not about commenting on the commercial sensitivity around that. It's about how we move forward together, you know, and, co and collaboratively. So I think, you know, it has been recognised and we are committed to improving it now. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so it mentions here about unauthorised home improvements being a major cause of high cost void. So if there's national law, please someone jump in and let me know. Um, but I'm just wondering, rather than say, uh, it's my understanding that council properties get like stripped out of like the improvements that are made. Um, but say if a, a tenant had like a, a genuine like up to standard floor input in place, would it not make more sense to leave it as is rather than having to strip out just because it's unauthorised or is it like a national law that sort of stops that? I've got the same question written exactly here. I don't know what the current state of play is, but I've watched that for 20 years. Somebody lays a beautiful laminate floor in place, a small fortune for next week, we're going to rip it out. And it's, it's been something I've been bashing my head off for years. If it looks good and it's standard and it really is of quality, leave it alone. If, please, could I ask to jump in there? So I think it, it goes back to what's in the void lettable standard, which is clearly an area within the improvement plan that we need to look at renegotiating and agreeing that. And we do try and take a common sense approach to that. But I think the discussions with the contractors in the past have been that once we re-let the property in the way it is, then we inherit what was in there. So whilst on the face of it, you know, I'm not saying that we do this because I do think there is a common sense approach, but in the case of a laminate flooring, if we were to inherit that, then we also inherit the ongoing maintenance. So when that goes wrong, we pick up the liability in terms of costs for putting that right. And if they're non-standard items, that could add further costs down the, down the line. But I think 
you know, I'm not in disagreement with you. It is because I think what's referred to in the report is where there are excessive alterations, like people have tried to put a loft conversion in and it's not got the right building regulations. There's been extensions built and they're single clad and potentially not got had planning permission. So we're talking about the extremes in those cases. Um, but I think it, the, the answer goes back to, well, what's the latable standard? What's the tenant's responsibility? What are we going to do? And what things are we comfortable with leaving? Um, yeah. Obviously, I won't name the area because I don't want to shame the tenant, but you mean like the pirate ship? The tenant that turned the front of his house into a pirate ship. Yeah, as long as it's like cost effective for the council, it obviously makes sense. If I like, get extensions which aren't going to be like, up to standard, yeah, get rid of them, sure. But I mean, where it makes sense, I think we should definitely look at getting that changed and yeah, putting that into uh... Any further questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Smith. I was just going to sort of summarise a little bit of what I've sort of taken from this, I suppose, in order to move forward. Um, I think the preventative part of this is definitely important. Uh, having essentially, I mean, you, you know, we have our vehicles, don't we? Most of us have a vehicle. You know, we have a we have a, a yearly MOT uh, to prevent, you know, big problems, big costs happening down the road to it. Um, and, and you know services as well included so there needs to be more preventative um, I just think we talk about a sort of holistic approach we, we keep mentioning that word but I think it is very again relevant here you know we need to consider all, all the different angles all the different variables to this there's obviously you know the contractors there's the internal uh, mechanisms within the council it, it, itself um, and you know coming on to the enforcement as well I think we can look at <laughs> making it more robust uh i take council doyle's you know point which is it's not always the monetary punishment i suppose because yeah a lot of them won't care they won't be able to respond to that in a sense um but if we can try and do what we can to show that it's not going to work for them in other ways potentially uh in terms of them living the lives that they want to live um then i think that uh, that can that could probably improve the situation. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Um, I did have some recommendations that I don't want to move as such, I want to quickly debate to see if they're the right recommendations, but just a final point for me. I still have a fundamental concern that price per property is one of our complications here. Price per property, while from budgetary terms from Townsborough Council is magnificent because we know exactly where we are every year. It also means potentially we've got contracts out there are not looking to do additional work. That's the danger of it. That gives me concern. I'm not moving a recommendation like that. I'm just putting it out there at the minute for food for thought that is price per property. Well, fantastic from our budgeting perspective means contracts are not looking for work. Whereas if we were going to pay them for whatever work they did, as we used to do, they will go find that work that needs doing. It's a concern I have, but we'll pack that for the minute. I had three thoughts and recommendations to send to Cabinet, which obviously will be the new municipal year now. So whether the cabinet is or whether the portfolio is, not my problem. One, the cabinet uh, instruct officers to look uh, to review cost versus return of actually employing an in-house inspection team to see if we can actually drive down the costs of voids and make it cost return. I can come up with better wording, but yeah. Number two, that we review the recovery slash how we recover damage costs from existing tenants and see if there is a better way we can approach that and a more proactive way long term. And three, the portfolio holder, again, whoever that may be, calls Equons in to explain why the members have major concerns about void turnarounds at the minute. And we ask of them to say what are their action plans to improve this and not an officer to do it, the cabinet member to do it. Those are the three I would like to move to centre cabinet in the new municipal year i've not moved them as such yet i do intend to move them but I'll obviously open the floor to debate before i look like i'm in rush up over the committee so anybody uncomfortable with those anybody got any thoughts anybody want any changes i do include the officers in the portfolio in that it's an open discussion gareth uh, thanks chair um how big is this team are you talking about for this uh, potential uh well, how many do you want in this team basically 
uh, that would be for Cabinet and the officers to review what would be required versus what returns we could get. If you had one doing it, what would be the return? If you had two doing it, would that pay for itself? If you employed a team of 10, would it massive? You've got to go do cost versus return. And I think we challenge our officers with the Cabinet member to go away and look at They may come back and say, you know, actually, we've really looked at it and it'll cost two million to do it and we might recover 200,000. We, we, we need the professionals to go review that. So I haven't got those answers at the minute. I'm not a housing expert. Unfortunately, I'm a logistics expert sometimes. <laughs> uh, Councillor Dodd. I've got no initial problem with that. Uh, the one thing which I iterated before was that we need to ensure that they've got the tools to do it with. Um, it's great having a team, but if, if they've got no bite, they'll be ineffective. So you need to ensure that they're ineffective. And going back to the report where it did label what a lot of the recharges were for rubbish, damage to property, etc., we need to be able to enforce and make sure that uh, there's a follow-up action. Thank you. If that's where we reach, I'm happy to move those three recommendations sent to Cabinet in the first municipal year. Seconded by Councillor Price. Quick, any quick questions or comments before we go to a vote? All those in favour? Go on, guys, stick your hands up. <laughs> Make it nice and unanimous. Uh, those are carried then, thank you very much. Um, Can I get the word in? We'll get the word in. We'll start the word in. Yeah. Well, I, th I think we've got the yeah, principle, yeah, and we just need to tidy the word. That's not a problem. Okay, but. Okay, uh, next item on our agenda is should be the working group if i've got the right page my apologies uh, working group updates obviously we've just done the void working group the only other working group we had briefly was the leaseholder insurance working group uh, which met literally a week ago monday last week uh, myself and gareth were present where we challenged the finance team about obviously the increase in leaseholder insurance costs uh, i took some notes uh, obviously we'll quickly bounce that off the committee We'll all be aware of the issue that's briefly been raised about, you know, our leaseholders have to pay for buildings insurance. That's done under the right to buy legislation. There's no way this council can ever get around that. Under the right to buy legislation, we have to purchase that building insurance and then spread the cost amongst our tenants. So if there's 4,000 um, tenants currently, and it's 400,000, sake of arguments, it's 40 quid each, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, whatever that works out at. However, obviously, with the slight adjustment of size of properties, there is some mechanics to how it's calculated. From what I understand from the officers, before this year's uh, leaseholder insurance costs went out, we employed an insurance broker called Marsh to test the market to see if the current deal we've got with ZM is still cost effective in the market. What came back is actually the costs are absolutely bang on with what the market's asking. So there actually isn't. You know, an insurance company that we took on long term is trying to overbill us. Their costs are reflecting what the market's telling us as well. Um, one of the issues that the reason the insurance has gone up is the amount of claims that have come in in the last two years. Um, basically, the leaseholders, obviously, against their insurance, make claims on a regular basis. Like any insurance, if you crash your car three times this year, good luck paying your insurance next year. It's an unfortunate consequence of the amount of claims that have gone in over the last two years. Um, Obviously, it falls under right to buy a legislation that this council must, we don't have a choice, ensure that these buildings have contents insurance and ensure the leaseholders pay their fair share. While we may feel, and you know, I've got sympathy as well, some of these bills have increased quite significantly this year. Unfortunately, they've increased because of the nature of the construction industry has got expensive, as we've seen through what we're doing in the town centre. They've increased because of the amount of claims that have gone in and it's the nature of the insurance business. Now, that is what we've discovered after the meeting with the finance team, I was comfortable. There's very little I feel we can do as members about that. I don't know if you had similar thoughts after the meeting, Gareth. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like I said, the market test was bang on with that. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm willing to open to any questions or comments, but from, from my p uh, personal opinion, I, I considered the matter, it is where it is. And while I have a lot of sympathy with some tenants whose insurance costs have gone up, I don't know what we can do about it as an authority. Councillor Doyle. Thank you. Um, I've got a resident that was affected by uh, this increase in insurance and it's doubled the premiums for herself. She's got, she understands that she has to pay it and she understands that prices have increased. Now, as an authority, are we in a position where we can give them longer to pay? Because we, we send them a notice and they're expected to pay within five to ten days 
Uh, one of the comments I got back that the, with the delays in the postal service, it wipes out some of their ability to pay. But if you're on benefits, then an increase of £120 on your insurance premiums, which is double what it was before, is quite a bit. Uh, for other people, not so. But are we in a position to offer them some sort of interest-free period so that they can pay it over a number of months rather than billing them uh, for it in one lump? Thank you. I will stare at Mrs Mustafa in the hope she might have some clue, but obviously it, um, it's a finance uh, remit rather than a housing remit, but Mrs Mustafa normally knows most things and uh, she's given me the lottery numbers for later, so uh, far away. I'm just going to come in and say that is, well, disclaimer, again, I'm not, you know, the finance director, but as I understood it, um, yes, they have the ability to spread those out. Um, I was going to also say that I've um, I've met uh, a few of those leaseholders that uh, have expressed um, their concerns with this. Um, some of it is just, of course, how it's been explained, I suppose, that they clearly obviously get the policy, but the policy in itself can be quite confusing. Um, so there has been, you know, just simple stuff, I suppose, like subsidence and whether it's included within the policy. So. Um, I think their fears have been reduced, um, but I think it's, it's, it's an ongoing one in terms of, um, for example, how it um, aligns to, I don't want to get too much into personal circumstances here, but you know, how it aligns to their own uh, potential mortgages or, 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 or bills that they're paying as well. So there's a little bit more to do, but I think as individual you know, councillors or ward councillors, we can, we can liaise with them and, uh, and you know, be there for them, I suppose. That's the dog. Uh, forgive me for this one. I only briefly seen the letter that, uh, for the sum that was asked for. Now, on that letter, I don't remember seeing anything that says they had, we could be given extra time to pay if they needed it. I think that needs communicating to the residents. Thank you. I think we've got agreement. <laughs> Any further questions or comments on this matter? Okay, happy to close that matter there, which takes us to item nine, uh, forward plan. Uh, this item calls for a review of the current forward plan to see if there's any items we'd like to see put on corporate scrutiny work plan for the next municipal year. I will not be here next municipal year, so I'll probably stay out of this one. But I'm happy to open the floor if there's anything on the forward plan we feel we recommend to the committee that's going to be in place for next year. I'm open to any suggestions. Okay, let's... <laughs> oh no, I know I'm not. <laughs> Councillor Doyle. Uh, as we've come to the end of this particular year, I'd just like to say, uh, I guess all of us feel the same way, but thank you to officers and that for supporting and cabinet members and also to the deputy chair and chair for chairing the meetings. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, obviously echo that thanks to officers and cabinet members uh, for their input this year. I think we've had a productive year. We could have potentially done a little bit more, we could have potentially done a little bit less, but we've got some good recommendations through and I think we've had a constructive year. So thank you to everybody that's taken part. And I'm happy to close the meeting there. And Councillor Price is behind the beers.